Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. We're continuing, of course, our study of the book of Acts. We're seeing the first century, basically, of the church. It's about the first 30 years that Luke records chords for us in the book of Acts. We've seen that the, the message of Jesus Christ began in Jerusalem, and it spread basically to Samaria and southern Judea, and then we see Jews, and both Jews and Samaritans and even Gentiles have trusted Christ. The message is even spread all the way to Antioch, which is in Syria. And, and here's the truth. And as the church grows, so also does the persecution. Per- persecution actually began with Jesus. They arrested him. They died. He rose again. And then, then the believers who have trusted in Jesus Christ, there's persecution. And if you remember back in Acts chapter 8, they talked about that Saul and some others began to persecute the church and people were spread uh, spread out. But as we continue this morning, we go back. We'd been in Antioch last time as we looked at the, the spread of the message and how, how uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas, actually was called Saul there. They had come together. And now we go back to Jerusalem. And as we go back to Jerusalem, this is involving Peter and James. And when you start thinking about the apostles, you remember there was James and John and Andrew and Peter. That was kind of the first four that were with Jesus. And there was the inner circle of Peter, James, and John. They were the ones closest to Jesus. And sometimes he would go places and he'd say, everybody else stay over there except Peter, James, and John. You come with me. Well, we're going to see this deals with Peter and James. And we see what happens. And it's really sad when you think about it because Peter gets put to death. I mean, excuse me, James gets put to death and Peter is thrown into prison. And they're planning to kill him too. And we might say, well, those are, the two, those are two of the main people in the whole church, two of the apostles. What are we going to do if they both get killed? What happens? How does the church respond? How do you and I respond to the trials and problems of life when things come? And as we look at this passage, we're going to think about that. We, we who belong to Jesus Christ and what's going on and what is God doing and how do we trust him. And, and one of the key things we have to realize is we have to trust him even in the trials of life. There's a, a saying that's sad but true, and that is life at best is, is difficult. Why? Well, we live in a fallen world. I mean, you think about it, we've got, we, we, we got it, we, it's great, we, we trust Christ, we have eternal life, we've got each other, we've got gifts, we've got all those things, but we live in a world that has fallen that is actually contrary to the truths of the Bible, and we experience trials and suffering and problems, how do we deal with that? Every one of us in this room, if you just had, each one of us come up and stand here for just a second and say, would you tell us about some of the trials that are going on in your life? Every one of us have got things we'd say, well, let me tell you what's happened here, and this has happened here, and this has happened here. How do we respond? What do we do? How do we respond? Uh, I, I don't, what's the, yeah, there we are. Okay, how do we respond? Sometimes we say, I, I'm, I don't think God ought to do this. Sometimes we're angry and we say, God, why did you let this happen to me? Sometimes it's just pitiful and we go, I don't know why this had to happen to me. And then sometimes we say, I don't think this is actually happening. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I just don't know what's happening. How should we respond? When things go wrong in life, well, Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made. Now, I think the next slide has that, I think. Yeah, how, maybe not. How should we respond? It is to trust in God, to take our prayer request to Him. Our response is to go to God in prayer and that we should turn to our Heavenly Father. And so every one of us in this room, we've got issues going on in our lives. And as we look at Acts chapter 12, problem arises in the church. They take Peter and James, two of the leaders, two of the main ones, the ones who have been with Jesus from the beginning, and they take James and they cut his head off. They kill him. And they take Peter when they realize this made everybody happy. When I talk about everybody, it made the Romans happy and it made the Jewish people happy. A lot of the Jews, they said, this is good to kill those Christians. So let's take Peter and put him in there as well. And we're going to learn, what do we do? How do we deal with these sort of things? Let me break down the passage for you. We're going to look at it this way. We're going to talk about how believers respond to trials and we see about problems and how the church responds. That's verses 1 through 5. Then in verses 6 through 11, we're going to talk about God's response to prayer. God answers prayer. And then we're going to see believers' attitude in prayer. Did the church who were praying for Peter, did they expect the answered prayer? We're actually going to go through verse 19. Go ahead, if you go back, please. We're actually going to go to verse 19 and just see uh, what happened after Peter was released from prison. So there's a lot of things. Let me show you three big things to think about. We're going to see these truths. When problems come, the proper response is prayer. Go to God. Second, as we're in the process of lifting up our prayers to God, supposed to be prayers to God, God is in the process of answering our prayers. And then last but not least, all prayers should be offered expecting God to answer. So think about this. 
When problems come, go to God. I'm sorry, stay on that one. When problems come, go to God. As we're in the process of lifting up our prayers, God is in the process of answering our prayers. And when we pray, we should expect God to answer. Well, let's think about where we are in the book. The book of Acts divides into three big sections. Chapters 1 through 7 is the spread of the message in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12 in Judea and Samaria. And chapters 13 through 28 to the ends of the earth. We're in the section 8 through 12. We're still seeing the message spread. It's already beginning to go a little further out. But we're still in Judea, Samaria. We're seeing Jerusalem and those kind of things. And so as we look at our passage this morning, this is where we are. We go back to Jerusalem. We're going to look at a trial that happens in the body. Peter's put in prison. James is killed. What's going to happen? So here's what we think with as we start. When trials come, we should respond in prayer. Let's think about it. Look at verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. Now it says about that time, this is about A.D. 44, Caligula. Let me just tell you, when you start thinking about Rome, there was Caesar Augustus, and then there was Tiberius, and then there was Claudius, and then there was a Caligula, and, and then there, uh, there was a Nero, of course. And, and we're seeing at this time there's this man who's the emperor of Rome named Caligula. He was a very evil man. It says, but about this time, Herod the king. And we'd say, who is this Herod guy? And we'll talk more about him in just a second. The church is growing. The message is spreading. But it says, about this time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. What has happened is this. The Christians, and, and more and more Jewish people are trusting in Christ. The Jews who put Jesus to death, who don't like this new way, they're beginning to persecute what we call the Christians. Rome doesn't really care either way, except the fact that this new ruler, his name is Herod Agrippa I, he is a friend of Jews. He actually likes the Jews. He's ruling this area, and because he knows that the Jewish people want the Christians persecuted, he decides as a Roman ruler to persecute the, the Christians. This is around 44 AD. So it says now about that time Herod the king, he's called Herod Agrippa I, he, it says, he decided, he, he, what he did is he decided to mistreat those who belong to the church. Let me tell you a little bit about this man. Herod Agrippa was the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one who, who killed all the little boy babies when Jesus was born. If you remember that guy, this is his grandson. He's a wicked man, but he 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 wanted to be. He wanted to have a rulership. And when Claudius became emperor, he was for Caligula. They had a battle. And so when Claudius found out, Claudius put him in prison. And then when Caligula came to be the emperor, he pulled him out of prison and gave him this part of the world to rule. So he is an evil man, and he doesn't, he likes Jews. In fact, he's friends with the Jews. And so what it says is this, about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some, on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. Now, the church are called the called out ones. I want you to think about that. That's who we are. The body of Christ, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, we've been called out of the world into a relationship with Christ. Because the word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. Ek means out of, kaleo means to call. We are the called out ones. Notice what happened. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, see, he wants to please the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. Now, all this was during the days of unleavened bread. Now, I want you to think about this. It said when he had, had James, the brother <coughs> of John, put to death with the sword. I want you to think about it. We all know who James and John are. James is the first apostle to die. John, these are brothers. John was the last apostle to die. These are the ones that were the inner circle with Jesus. The best we can understand that when it said put to death with the sword, that means they cut his head off. What they did is they brought James out in Jerusalem in front of the crowds, Jewish people cheering, I'm sure, and they killed him and cut his head off. When he saw that it pleased the Jews that this was good, he decided he would arrest Peter because Peter is the, is the main man, you know that. And this all happened during unleavened bread. This is Passover time. Unleavened bread was a feast. Passover was on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. Unleavened bread was the 15th through the 21st. So this is a week in what would be corresponding to our March and April. It's about, it's about what we'd call Easter. And so at that time, he decided that he would put Peter into prison. And when the Passover was over, when this unleavened bread time was over, he would bring Peter out and kill him in front of everybody. Notice verse 3 again. When... 
When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was time during the days of unleavened bread. So the Jews are glad, and, and this is a, a great time. Now, Peter's an amazing man. We're seeing a study in Sunday school called The Sayings of Peter. And Peter is the guy that you all know that was one of the disciples of Jesus from the very beginning. And on the last night, as Jesus was about to go to the cross, Jesus tells Peter, Peter, before the, de before the night is over, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, that'll never happen. And Jesus said, oh, that's going to happen. And he did. He denied him three times. He was afraid. And what we see is after the death and resurrection of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit came upon Peter, Peter became bold. And he was able to stand up on the day of Pentecost and proclaim Jesus Christ. And he's done this for, for years now. He's been powerful. Well, now they've got him arrested, and they've put him in prison, and the plan is to kill him. Notice verse 4. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. Now, four squads are in the soldiers. That's 16 soldiers. There's four in each squad. So he's got 16 soldiers guarding Peter. Now, let me tell you what they did. They'd have the the inside of, a, of the jail was, was an inner part, and that's where they put Peter. And the best that we can understand is they put Peter in this room, and they chained him to two other Roman soldiers. So he's kind of chained to soldiers. Then the door is closed, and then there are two other soldiers out front of that door. That's all within the prison. We don't know if, and best we can understand is about every few hours, four soldiers would come in and they would take the place of the next four soldiers. There were 16 soldiers. Some people believe that maybe he had all 16 soldiers there at one time guarding Peter. We don't know. If you remember back at the very beginning of the church, some amazing things happened. Sometimes they threw people in prison, Peter and James, and they'd be out the next day because the angel would come let them out. So maybe they said, we better get 16 soldiers and guard this carefully because we don't want anybody getting out. So it says, when they seized him, they put him in prison, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. That's the plan. What a problem. How are you going to respond to this? Look, James is dead. Do y'all realize who James is? I mean, this is James and John. These are the sons of thunder. These, these are the ones that, that, that are the main ones that, that, that Jesus you know, was with. And here's Peter, the spokesman and the leader. And we've got James dead. And we've got Peter about to be killed. What's going to happen to the church when the main leaders are gone? That's what they're wondering. What's going to happen to the believers? What do they do? Well, look. Verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Notice what happens. He's in prison, but look what the church is doing. Look what the believers are doing. Prayer was being made. Now, the way it's written in the Greek, it's the idea of kept on being made. They didn't just pray once. They kept on praying. People were coming together and saying, look, we need to get some groups. They're going to kill Peter. We better be praying. Oh, Lord, please get Peter out. Oh, Lord, protect Peter. In fact, we're going to see that they're going to go to, to, a, pers uh, to a, a lady's house. Uh, she's uh, uh, fairly, her name is Mary. Obviously, she's fairly wealthy because a whole bunch of people go to her house. She's got a big enough house that the whole group of people are going to meet together and pray for Peter for him to be released. It'd be like us saying, look, something, you know, is coming on. We need to get together in groups. Let's get 20 or 30 people. Let's go over to this house. Let's get some people to go over to this house. So I'm sure the people, the believers were praying. And what do you think they were praying? Oh, Lord, please deliver Peter. Please get Peter out of there. See, the church, what they did, when the trial come, they responded by going to God in prayer. And when the trials come in our lives, and they come every day, you need to go to God in prayer. We need to say, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but I trust you. Whether it's the family and sicknesses and relationships and, and bills we don't know if we can pay and heartache and sadness and ups and downs, we have to take those things to our Savior. Let me tell you what you can do. Anytime something is going on in your life and you want people to pray, just call the office. We have a prayer chain and we have a, a, a th thing that uh, the, the email prayer chain that if you give a request, it'll be sent to hundreds of people that'll start praying for whatever you need us to pray about. Psalm 121 says, where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. Nothing is too big, nothing is too small to bring to God. How do you respond when the trials come? How did the church 
respond when James was killed and Peter was put into prison expecting to be killed. Well, watch what happens. This is what's so amazing. The church is praying. Notice our big number two. As we are in the process of praying, God is in the process of answering. Do you believe that? Let me ask you a question. Do you actually believe that? Do you believe that when you pray, God's going to answer your prayer? Do you believe that as you're in the process of lifting up your prayer request to God, that he's in the process of answering your request? He is. Let's watch what happens. As we lift up our petition, let me show you a verse. Look at this verse. Isaiah 65, 24. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they're still speaking, I will hear. He knows what you think before you ever think it. He knows why you think what you think. He knows what you want to say. He knows what your quest are. He knows your heart. God is answering even while we're asking. Well, watch what happens. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. Now, let me ask you a question. If you got word that the next morning they were going to take you out and cut your head off, what would you be doing the night before? You'd probably be going back and forth and saying, I don't know, I don't know, am I going to get out of it? Oh, Lord, you've got to get me out of this. I may pray all night to get out of this. We know that the believers are in different places praying for Peter to be released. They now know that the next day they're going to bring Peter out and probably cut his head off. So what is Peter doing the night before they bring him out? Notice, on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was what? Sleeping. Sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards are in the front of the door watching over the prison. See, he's not, ch- he's not going back and forth going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. He's asleep. He's asleep. Why is he sleeping? Are you ready for this? Jesus told him he's going to live to an old age. Did you remember that? There was a time Jesus said to him, when you're young, you will be able to go anywhere you want to go. But when you are old, they will take you and take you where you don't want to go. Peter's not old here. You know what Peter says? I don't think it's time. I think I'm going to go to sleep. I think God's going to do something miraculous. At least, I hope he's going to do something miraculous, right? Isn't that what we think? He's sleeping between now. Remember, he's chained to two soldiers, so he's asleep. Two soldiers. There's the 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 gate to the cell, and there's two soldiers out there guarding. We don't know where any other soldiers are, but there's probably more because this is a prison. Watch what happens. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, "Get up quickly." And his chains fell off his hands. Now, you know, when you study this, and especially in the original language, it's, here's what I pictured. I pictured the angel going in there and went, wake up, wake, wake up. We don't want to wake these guys up. That's what you thought. That's not what happened at all. The angel appears. A light comes on there. And literally in the Greek, it comes over and he slugs him. That's what it says. He hit him hard. Get up, man. Get up. Literally in the Greek, he hit him hard, waking him up, and said, get up quickly. And when he got up, the chains fell off his hands. And then look what he says to him. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Now, we got two verses on Peter getting dressed, right? It always amazes me. We got a verse that says, and James was put to death with the sword. That's all it says. And we got two verses on Peter getting dressed. I've never understood that. You'd think there'd be more information on what happened to James, but we got two verses on Peter saying, I've got to put my sandals on. Let me get my sandals on. Let me, you know, let me do this. It says, and he went out and continued to follow. And he did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. Peter didn't know whether he was dreaming or not. He thought, maybe I'm just dreaming, you know, because I am asleep, and maybe I'm, I'm thinking that I'm getting out, and maybe this is what God's doing, and, and I'm just having a dream. He didn't know it was real watch what happened and when they passed the first and second guard they came to the iron gate that leads into the city which opened for them by itself and they went out and went along the street and immediately the angel disappeared departed from him listen he, he, he got up he put on his clothes they went out the door those two soldiers never woke up. The two soldiers at, at the front were, were, were guarding the thing. Apparently, they 
they just were in a sleep or something. And he walked through there and he walked through the rest of the prison. And when they came out, they came to the gate that, that was the gate leading into, onto the city. And when they got there, the door opened by itself. Because that was a locked gate, but it just opened by itself. And they walked out. And when they got on the street, Peter looked around and all of a sudden the angel was gone. Verse 9, he went out and continued to follow, and he didn't know what was being done by the angel. It was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. And when they passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And he went out and went along the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Now, if you're Peter, what, what do you think? But look, the prayer had been answered. You remember, these people, what are the people praying for at Mary's house? They're praying that Peter be released. You know they're not praying Peter's going to be killed, right? They're not praying for that. What are they praying for? They said, oh, Lord, please release Peter. Oh, please keep Peter safe. We've already lost James. Please get Peter safe. Oh, Lord, somehow deliver Peter. Oh, Lord, somehow deliver Peter. Their prayer's already answered. Are they still praying for the Lord to deliver Peter? What do you think? Of course they are. As, while they were in the process of lifting up their prayer, what? God was in the process of answering. He's already answered their prayer. Did you know sometimes we're praying to God, we don't know what He's already answered it. We, he's already answered it. When Peter came to himself, he said, he went, whoa, whoa. Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from what all the Jewish people were expecting. He said, wow, uh, now I know what God's doing. God didn't want me to die right now. He, he already told me I was supposed to live to be old age anyway. And now he doesn't want me to die. He's delivered me from Herod who wanted to kill me and from the Jewish people who wanted to kill me. While the church was in the process of lifting up their prayers, God is in the process of answering those prayers, and he does the same for us. You may say something like this, though, but wait a minute. I prayed a lot of times. I don't see any answers. I mean, sometimes I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and it didn't even come to pass. In fact, I was praying for something, and then I never did get it. Does God answer prayer? God does answer prayer. Sometimes the answer is yeah. Sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's wait. Now let's think about it for just a second. Sometimes when we ask for things, and we, he gives us what we ask for. Sometimes we say, oh, Lord, would you please do that? Oh, Lord, please. Do. And he does it, and you go, I can't believe he did it. Have you ever prayed for something, and you got it, and then after you got it, you thought, man, I wish I hadn't got this. Sometimes. <laughs> And sometimes he, he says, you know, I'm going to give you a yes here, but you're really not going to want it. But sometimes it answers, yeah, and sometimes he will just answer our prayers. And we say, oh, Lord, deliver Peter, and he delivered Peter. And we'll say, oh, Lord, would you do this, and he delivers. But sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes we say, oh, Lord, I want this, I want this, I want this. And he doesn't give us what we ask for. You know why? Because he knows what's best. And I don't want to embarrass Jean, but once when, when I was in seminary, I met this blonde girl, and we started dating, and I thought that she would be the one for me. I thought she was. And so I remember going and I said, oh Lord, this is the girl I want. I want this girl. And you know what? Took her right out of my life. And I was sort of mad for a while because the answer was no. But what I didn't realize, he had something so much better for me. I just didn't know it. And see, he didn't even, he answered no for that prayer. But I used to say, oh Lord, please let me get married someday. Please let me bring somebody into my life. And you know what his answer was? You're gonna have to wait. It's not time. And so sometimes he gives us yeses, and sometimes he gives us noes, and sometimes he gives us waits. And sometimes you can't tell the difference between a no and a wait. You can't. That's why he says, be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication, and let your request be made known. That's why he says, keep on praying, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. It's okay to say, Lord, please do this. And sometimes you'll realize, I think it's a no. And sometimes you'll say, I think it's a wait. I'm still going to keep asking on this. And sometimes it's yeses. Now, there are times that he doesn't answer your prayer. I'm going to come back to it in just a minute, and I'll show you why. Why some unanswered prayers? And we'll see that in a minute. We realize that when the problems come, we should be lifting up our quest to God. We realize that when we're lifting up our request to God, he's in the process of answering those requests. Now, it may be a yeah. It may be a no. It may be a wait. In this particular instance, it was a yes. They were praying, please get Peter out, and God got him right out. Peter says, now I know for sure the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. 
Now, if we would go to the house of Mary and say, do you think your prayers are going to be answered? What would they say? Yes, because God loves us and he answers our prayers. Watch. Verse 12, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who is also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. As we get to this third part, look at this. All prayers should be offered expecting an answer. Now, the answer may be yes, and the answer may be no, and the answer may be wait, but expect an answer. God is listening. God answers prayer. The church had turned to God. God has answered their prayer. They don't know it yet. And what we expect is that they are expecting Peter to show up are expecting to find out that Peter's safe. Watch what happens. He comes to the house of Mary, who's, mo- who's the mother of John, who's also called Mark. Now, many of you will remember who John Mark is. John Mark is the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark. He's going to travel with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. That's Acts chapter 13. We'll get to that in a little bit. So he's kind of a famous guy here. And is, obviously, if it's a house where many were gathered together, that means, obviously, she was wealthy for, in those day and time to have a home big enough for a number of people to come in. Now, let me describe something to you. Those homes normally, you had a home, and then you had a, like a garden area, and then you usually had a wall around the home that were wealthier people and a gate out front. And so if you wanted to go to their house, you'd come to the gate, and you'd knock on the gate. Somebody would come out of the house, come across the garden, and open the gate for you if they were going to let you in. That were the wealthier people. So uh, people who weren't wealthy didn't have gardens or gates or anything. They were lucky to have homes. So this is a bigger home, and this is a person that's wealthier. So he comes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who's also called Mark, and they were all together praying. What are they praying for? Oh, Lord, please deliver Peter. They've already got the answered prayer. They don't even know it yet. So watch. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Now, see, servant girl, so these people are, she's wealthy enough to have servants. And a servant comes to the, you know what the name Rhoda means? It means a little rose. That's her name. She's a little rose. And so she came to the door to answer. And she's a, 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 the word servant girl there means a little girl. She was young. She may have been 12 to 13 to 14 years old, for all we know. So she goes to the door, but look, when she recognized Peter's voice because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. You can see Peter going, boom, boom, boom. And Rhoda comes and he says, Rhoda, it's me, Peter. Ah. She runs back in. He goes, could you not have opened the door? I mean, good. hello? You know, she goes back in. She's so excited. And what does it say? She, when she recognized Peter's voice because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but she ran, ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. Okay, what have they been praying for all this time? For Peter to get out. She comes in and says, Peter's outside at the gate. And what do they say? Of course. We knew he would be. We've been praying. You know that when you offer up your prayers to God, he's in the process of answering, and he always answers our prayers. And so we knew this would happen. Isn't that what they do? No, they don't do that. They said to her, you're out of your mind, right? But she kept insisting that it was so. She kept saying it. And they said, well, no, no, it's his angel. Now, we'll talk about what that means here in just a second. So the response was not, yes, we knew God would answer it. Their response was, I think, you're, I think you've lost it. I think you've lost it. Obviously, you can't be out there. See, I think the next slide. They said, you're crazy. You've lost your mind. They said, it's, it's possibly his angel. Now, we're not sure what they actually meant by that. Could it mean that it was his guardian angel who would come? Or could it mean that maybe it was his spirit that they've already killed him and it's just the spirit of Peter out there? They don't, they don't know. But notice, Peter kept knocking. You can see him out there going, hello, it's me, come on. And they opened the door, and when they came and opened the door, they saw him, and they were amazed. How could this be? What do you mean, how could it be? What have you been praying for? What did you ask God to do? Well, we asked God to let Peter out. There he is. Oh, we never expected that. You didn't? When you offer up prayers, do we expect that God's going to answer the prayers? See, they weren't really expecting that. How many times do we pray not really expecting an answer? Oh, I mean, I talk to God, but I just don't, I don't think this is going to happen. Do you really think that some in your family that you have prayed for for years will come to know Jesus Christ as Savior? 
There are some of you in your families that you pray for every day that they do not know Christ and you're praying, oh Lord, somehow I pray they will come to know Christ. Do you actually believe they will? Do you believe some people that we know who are sick are going to get well? Do you believe that God, when you pray, that he's going to supply every need that you have? For some of you in college, do you actually believe you're going to make it through this year? You know, when we pray, look at this, I found this quote. The only limits on prayer are the promises of God and his ability to fill those promises. Ian Bounds. See, when we pray, we expect an answer. Matthew 21, 22, whatever you ask believing, you shall receive. Now, I, I said a while ago that sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the answer is wait. But are there times when you might could have got a yes answer, but you don't get an answer? Why? Well, two things that we find. One is that if there's sin in your life, and you find it in uh, one of the Psalms that said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? Does anybody know that verse? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He not, he's, you've got sin in your life. He's going to say, deal with your sin before I deal with your prayer request. And then James chapter 4, verse 3 says, sometimes we ask and we don't get because we ask with the wrong motive. See, the motive for prayer and the motive for, for asking for things is that God would be what? Glorified. I mean, ultimately, everything we do is for the glory of God. And sometimes we ask for things, and we're asking for it maybe with a selfish motive. And he says, well, I'm not going to do that. You're going you're to have to align with my will, which is to for the glory of God, that kind of thing. So sometimes that way. But most of the time, when you think about it, when you lift up your prayers, it's either going to be a yes or a no or a wait. And while you're lifting those prayers up, God is answering those prayers. So when we pray, expect the answer Look what he did. Peter continued knocking. They opened the door. They were all amazed. It was just amazing what, what happened there. And look what he did. But motioning to them with his hand to be quiet or to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had let him out of prison. And he said, report these things to James and to the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. Now, he motioned with his hand. He was like, be quiet. Why was he wanting them to be quiet? He didn't want too much noise because the soldiers might find out where he is. They hear this disturbance at this house. They might figure it out. He said, listen, be quiet. Here's what God did. He said, an angel, chains fell off. It was amazing. I got up. I put my clothes on. The door opened by itself. Went out right by these guards. They were all asleep. I went out to the street. The door opened by itself. It was an angel. He just let me out of there. You can see him going, wow, that is amazing. And then it says, he said, go tell James and the brethren. Who is James? This is not James and John because that James has already been killed. This most likely is Jesus' half-brother who became the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, which the book of James that we always talk about, this is who this guy is. He had become the leader of the church at Jerusalem. And so Peter actually says, go tell James and the brethren what happened. And he left and went to another place. Doesn't tell us where he went because... Nobody needed to know where he went because we didn't want anybody finding out where he went. So they couldn't find him. Notice, then when the day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. Can you imagine one of those soldiers waking up and they still chained, but the chain that was with Peter is gone. Uh, he's gone. And they went, wait a minute. And the two guys out the door said, we never saw anybody go out. And the guys later on, we never saw anybody go out. And they said, well, the door, the outside door was locked. How could anybody get out of here? They didn't count on an angel, and they can't, didn't count on God's deliverance. The, this to me, it's sad in verse 19. When Herod had searched for him and did not find him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away. It just literally says, led away. If your Bible's like mine, it puts two execution in there. That's in italics, which means it's not really there. But most believe that to be led away meant that they were led away to be put to death. Because a Roman soldier who was a guard, and if someone under that they were guarding got away, normally the Roman soldier was put to death. So this is probably what he's talking about. Then he, this is Herod, went down from Judea to Caesarea, and was spending time there. And if you want to read ahead, and we'll see it next week, what happened to this man named Herod? If you just read the next three or four verses between now and next week, you'll see what happened to this evil man. Wow. Church has a problem. They turn to God in prayer. That's what we should do. God answers the prayer while they're asking the prayer. And the church ultimately wasn't even expecting the answer, but when we ask our prayers... 
we should expect the answers. Let me give you some applications. When the trials and problems come, we should respond by turning to God in prayer. Be anxious for nothing but everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. You can come to Him anytime, anyplace, anywhere about anything. There's nothing too small. There's nothing too big. You come to Him and say, Lord, help me in this. Give this to me. Do this. I want. When the trials come, go to God. That's what we have to do. How do you respond when the trials come? Is it anger and bitterness or is it prayer? Second, expect God to answer your prayers. Now the answer may be yes and no and all those kind of things, but, uh, but, but expect God to answer your prayer. Look at this right here. While you're in the process of asking, he's in the process of answering. You, you understand that? He actually knows what you're going to ask for you ever ask it. Sometimes he's already got the answer before you ask it. He's a great God. He loves us beyond what we could imagine. So while we're in the process of asking, he's answering. It may be a yes and it may be a no and it may be a wait, but he's going to give you the very best answer at exactly the right time. Second, and just think about this. Examine your life. Let's make sure there's no sin in our lives when we're praying and, and be sure that when we, we ask our prayer requests that, that we have the right motives, that we're not having a motive to, for us, but it's really for His glory and according to His will. So when the trials come, turn to God in prayer, knowing that He's going to be answering those prayers while we're asking them and expect that God will answer your prayers. <laughs> 